All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and start us off. I'd like to thank you all for coming um, to the second London Talks that we've had. Um, today we are going to be talking about can we grow food on the Green Belt, which is kind of a different type of topic when we think about Green Belt. Usually it's only about housing or use in that sense. So we're trying to change it and mix it up a little bit here. Um, in terms of our speakers today, we've got Alan Mace, who's done a lot of work on the Green Belt and looking at kind of possibilities of opening it up and changing it to a degree. We've got Martin Stott, who writes um, quite a bit um, on urban, well, on farming, on allotments, can I say as Lord Muck? Yeah. As Lord Muck. Um, and I think it's a blog that she did, yeah? Mm -hmm. So that should be very good. And he's also an alumni. Um, we have other alumni here as well, everybody from 76. Yes, so it's good. And we also have Paul Miner, who's from CPRE, who will be putting case, um, forward the case for Green Belt as well. Um, so just to let you know, for those of you who haven't been here about the format, we're tr trying to keep it quite informal. So we'll have just 10 minutes from our speakers to each speak. Um, and they're going to try to address this question itself. And then what we want to do is open it up to the audience so we can actually have kind of more of a discussion rather than us talk at you, you sit there, and then leave. So we're trying to make it a lot more interactive. Um, so without further ado, I will um, start with Alan. Do you want to start? I think I didn't send you starting. No, okay. I'm so yeah. sorry. Thank you. I will stand up. No, yeah. Do you, need, do you want to do your own? Okay. So I think just talking amongst ourselves on the table, we have three quite different um, approaches to this, so they are quite disparate. And I'm, I don't normally read, but I'm going to read today. So, can we grow food on the green one? Growing our own food is like caring for the frail and Ill, uh, for the frail elderly and healing sick children. I would hardly want to argue against this. But in the case of growing food on Greenbelt, I want to address two questions. First, is the Greenbelt a good place to focus on as a place to grow food? And second, why are we focused on the Greenbelt as an option? On the first question, I'll distinguish between farming and self-grow, concentrating on the latter. Over 20% of London's land is Greenbelt. But we must address where this is. Because the aim of the Greenbelt is to constrain the further outward growth of cities, Greenbelt is in outer London boroughs. This is important because it means that access to the Greenbelt is anything but equal. So let's think about outer London, where the Greenbelt is. It's not a homogeneous environment, but it is dominated by semi-detached houses with gardens. Another feature of outer London is the generous provision of parks incidentally sometimes formed by the landscape gardens of former country manor houses. To personalise this, I live in walking distance of the Greenbelt, in a house with a garden, and close to three large parks, two of which are former landscape gardens. So I couldn't put my actual address on him, but here is very near where I live, with lots of green gardens, as you can see, within walking distance of the Greenbelt. Uh, this is where I live on the map, and you can see these large parks Greenbelt's just off the top there um, in North London and another large park here. In short, Greenbelt is closest to London residents who already have the best, best access to places to grow food. What about those in inner London who are not close to the Greenbelt? 
An important way of offering these people the chance to grow food is allotments. Allotments in the UK date back to, in law, to 1809, I have to say, according to Wikipedia. They are an idea that has been around for longer, therefore, than the Green Belt itself. Unfortunately, allotments are not evenly distributed around London either. And here's a map of the distribution of allotments in London. Unfortunately, the person who did this not be the inner London one, a lot somebody in the London ones are in grey, that's because Google only allows you so many colours. But as you can see, they are more up in outer London than inner London. So once again, the suburbs come off better. In Wandsworth, in inner London, there are around 1,300 people on the waiting list uh, for allotments as of 2018. In 2006, the GLA wrote a report on London's disappearing allotments. And in 2017, London's longest surviving allotment space in Ealing, in West London, was under threat of being developed for housing. Although the new London plan, which is still in draft, places much emphasis on growing food, including in the Greenbelt, the GLA, to the best of my knowledge, hasn't updated its own data on allotments in London since 2007, even though in 2006 the report stated we will now be monitoring allotment provision in London. I argue that preserving all Greenbelt and the threat to allotments uh, are related. Allotments are under threat because of the shortage of land for housing. Maintaining over one-fifth of London as Greenbelt, all of it in outer London, places pressure on available land. Now, as many allotments are in outer London, maybe that's not a problem, but many are in inner London too, where the pressure to densify is most keenly felt. Notwithstanding, there are innovative examples of micro-allotments in inner London, including near to Old Street, where New Deal for Community developed raised beds for food growth on the swords of grass, uh, swords around uh, tower blocks. Uh, and this is a communal effort in um, micro allotment growing food, where some residents tend to uh, these allotments and others uh, crop the food with, uh, with a greenman. On Caledonian Road in North London, a health centre had a small uh, plot of land which it made available for people registered with the GP to come uh, and um, engage in community growing of food. So in summary of self grow we need to be aware of the une uneven availability of Greenbelt and we should be looking to maximise space for self-growth in inner London. Maintaining the current extent of Greenbelt is not the sole reason, but it adds to the pressure on small spaces uh, and allotments in inner London. Let me turn briefly to commercial farming in the Greenbelt. I'm not inclined to the politics of the Adam Smith Institute, but I will quote from a report produced by Tom Hatworth in 2015, and to quote, Greenbelt has exacerbated the UK's planning crisis by encouraging the protection of rural land adjacent to thriving cities. It is hard to imagine a less efficient use of land in growing rapeseed in, uh, in the fields around Romford, which is a, a part of this line. The crop in this example is pertinent. I doubt that rapeseed is harvested for sale in Romford Market nor processed in the town centre. <coughs> More likely it's processed far away before being nationally distributed uh, directly or in products by a supermarket chain. There are farms in the Green Belt that welcome in local school children, and even some that sell their produce locally, but let's not assume that this is the default model. So this brings me to my second question. If Green Belt farms uh, don't necessarily produce products for local people, and if Greenbelt is most accessible to Londoners who have the best access to back gardens anyway, why are we talking about the potential to grow feed food on the Greenbelt? And here potential is the important word. Because it takes us to the heart of the Greenbelt. Greenbelt designation is a negative power to stop development, rather than a positive power to make the land open to the public or to demand that the land is carefully managed for environmental benefit. This is so because the state can designate land as Greenbelt without owning it. The state, therefore, has the power to fix the present use, but not to dictate any change in the use or the management of the land. The lack of ownership is not really a problem if you remember that Greenbelt is primary, primarily an aesthetic policy. Its main purpose is to maintain openness to keep a visual divide between the urban and the rural. 
Green Belt is not an environmental policy or a policy to give public access to open land or to provide land to grow food on. But once you keep the land open, there is potential to exploit this openness in various ways. There is the potential to increase biodiversity. There is the potential to give access to public space. And there is the potential to grow food. However, in all cases, this potential comes up against the fact that much of the Green Belt is private land. Designating it Green Belt suggests the possibility of, but does not offer a mechanism to deliver, potential uses. So I worry that these potential uses are nothing but an empty promise on the future use, uh, on, on the future, used to defend the present day Green Belt. The Green Belt is a policy of openness, of not building on designated land. Maybe it's time to consider some selective loss of this openness in exchange for reduced pressures on land and therefore house prices and for increased densities, which incidentally impact in the London more than outer London. To resist this pressure, the Green Belt is presented as offering openness and the promise of future increases in biodiversity. Openness and the future promise of public access. Openness and the future promise of growing your own food and local farm produce. This use of incidental benefits to defend the Green Belt is well illustrated through the process of developing the new London plan currently under examination. The Mayor is absolute in defending all of London's Greenbelt through this plan. In the original public draft, new claims for the Greenbelt emerged to justify a no-change policy. Namely, that Greenbelt had the potential to help combat the urban heat island effect. The GLA, the Greater London Assembly, with the Mayor, had earlier set out several ways the city might reduce urban heat islands, including cool pavements, green roofs and sky view factors. It didn't suggest Greenbelt was helping address the issue. And this, I would suggest, is because the academic literature shows that the urban heat island is localised. Greenbelt and Totteridge did not reduce the uh, urban heat island effect in Tower Hamlets. Indeed, maintaining the Greenbelt would likely create more local urban heat island effects uh, because, as I've already said, limiting the amount of land available forces high density development on what is available and this high-density development creates canyon effects and other features that produce urban heat islands. So spurious was this justification for Greenbelt that it did not survive long, being removed from the draft prior to the official examination which is underway at present. And I like to think um, the removal was as a result uh, of uh, one of my earlier blogs, uh, which this presentation forms a part of. To close, I have no objection to seeking to grow food on the Greenbelt. I also uh, have no objection to caring for the frail elderly or healing sick children. But the uneven distribution of green, green Belt means that the policy will benefit those Londoners who already have most access to open land. We should focus instead on creative solutions. We should focus instead on creative solutions to growing food in inner London, and in so doing, recognise that maintaining all of London's Green Belt adds to the difficulty of that task. So why are we focused on the Greenbelt? I fear because we're offering promises on the future that primarily serve to maintain the Greenbelt as it is. If the promise of growing food on the Greenbelt makes more difficult Greenbelt reform, then this could prove to be a very costly crop. Paul, would you like to go next? And do you have a PowerPoint that I'll oh, do? Yeah. Is it? Uh, yeah. Is it? 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 Is
we're ba- we have a national charity which I work for, which is based in London, but we also have a network of local groups I- in the counties and regions of England. And a few years ago, we, we published a document called 2026 Vision for the Countryside, which sets out how we'd like to see the English countryside as a whole develop in time for our 100th anniversary in, in 2026. And the key point in this connection is that we believe that in 2026 there should be more green belt that's better protected, but also with better land use in it, particularly that the kind of benefits that Alan mentioned about more local food, more nature conservation and more public access, and also helping to contribute to mitigation of an adaptation to climate change. We've also produced a more detailed vision for the future of farming, which is guiding our work on the, the government's current environment bill and the major reforms to agricultural policy that are currently taking place under Michael Gove. And here are, the, here are some of the main points. And again, I particularly emphasise the points here about local food networks, you know, environmentally sustainable far, farming and more, and more investment in agri-environment schemes. So rather than focusing too much on production, there's a lot of post-war British agricultural policy as then we let's focus more on public goods such as again the, the things I mentioned earlier particularly on nature conservation and th- this just shows all the green belts in England metropolitan green belt by far the largest but there are 13 others in England and, and, it, and it is the nearest experience of countryside for about 30 million people in urban areas so countryside as well as urban green spaces and Alan mentioned some of the point, fundamental points of Greenback policy. One of the other key points about Greenback policy, as well as it being open, is that it's also intended to be permanent. So it's intended to last for longer than the typical 15-year life of a local plan. And the, the, this element of Greenback policy was originally informed by the former Ministry of Agriculture, which said that they, they wanted certainty that that farmland that they invested in wasn't going to be constantly de-designated or reviewed in every local plan. And, and that policy has is, is survived as a key tenet of Greenbelt policy ever since, and, and it remains it, in the national planning policy framework to this day, and for us it's one of the absolutely key points that, of, of Greenbelt, and it's, one, it's also a key reason for us why the policy has succeeded, where many other attempts to prevent protect urban fringes of other cities have failed. So it, if you look at studies that have been produced by the United Nations, the European Commission and others, they found that it's the, it's the undeveloped land around large, <coughs> the largest towns and cities in Europe, continental Europe and North America that have been lost to development. And it's been precisely those same areas of land that Greenbelt policy on the whole has successfully protected for, over the longer term. Uh, we will make these slides available, uh, that they'll be sent round. The, the next few slides get, give data from a, t- a 2010 report that we did jointly with Natural England called Green Belts and Greener Future, and we've also done more subsequent research, which I'll, which I'll talk about. And, uh, and it, this shows that, that, that the Green Belt is overall rural landscape, but it is under pressure for, for change for a number of things, partly housing, but also infrastructure development, such as motorway sewage works and pylons, high-speed railway lines, do I say it as well. Uh, but, but in terms of, of, of all positive uses, as people might describe them, there are particular concentrations of public rights of way, Broadly from mixed leaf woodland, that's particularly the case around London, <coughs> country parks and local wildlife sites. And there's been a significant increase in the number of local wildlife sites in green belts since we did this research. And, and again, with, with the link to agriculture, that's, that's quite important because a lot of the... Uh, I think there's a, a general shift in opinion, particularly in DEFRA and other experts, that that the future positive use of the Green Belt is probably going to focus mainly on nature conservation and access. And indeed, if you look at the UNPPF, where it, where it talks about Green Belt reviews, it says that local authorities should make compensatory improvements to, to the biodiversity and access to Green Belt land. There's nothing mentioned about encouraging agriculture or more sustainable local food growing. So it's seen that these areas are the main priorities. There's some more detailed facts here, but I mean, 
I, I mean, it's striking that Greenbelt areas are actually quite similar to the countryside as a whole in terms of land, overall land use within them. And, the, and again, although there's a fairly strong amount of Greenbelt that's in agricultural use, in 2010 a relatively low proportion of it was covered by environmental agreements that were negotiated by Natural England, and that might be for a number of reasons in particular because of the relative fragmentation of the farmland. But another thing that we found out in 2010 is that there's quite a high proportion of farm shops in the green belt. So the University of Sheffield did some analysis for that report, which found that in terms of number of farm shops per thousand residents, there is actually a significantly higher proportion in the green belt than there, there was in the countryside <coughs> as a whole. And there were particular concentrations in London, the West Midlands, and south and West Yorkshire. So why, why, why is farming in the green belt and the wider urban fringes important? It's often been said that farming is particularly difficult in these areas because of urban intrusion, trespass, uh, other reasons. But, but you do need to encourage long-term management in that. And, uh, and that's why we need to do what we can to, to encourage existing farmers to stay where possible uh, and inc encourage a longer-term approach to land management. And there is a growing urban interest whether in out of cities or, or in the cities, in locally sourced food, which can be tapped. And I'm going to give some examples of how, how this is done. Um, and, and it is quite an important area which needs to be further appreciated. But, because again, going back to what I said about nature conservation, if you take Professor Deesa Helm, for example, who's the chair of the government's Natural Capital Committee, he's done a paper called In Defence of the Green Belt, which I recommend you all read, certainly from my perspective anyway, but it's well worth a read for, for a different view to that put by many economists on green belt policy. But, but again, he puts a particular fo focus on nature conservation and perhaps he, you might accuse him of giving up on farming and agriculture. But, but I think there are good examples of a different approach which I think are important to bear in mind. And in 2012, the, the, the Making Local Food Consor well, Consortium, which was led by the Plunkett Foundation, but there are seven organisations involved in it, including us. We're, we, we commissioned some research on this, which looked at small-scale food production around urban areas. And there are seven case studies in the, in the, uh, in the reports, all of which are in Greenbelt areas across the country. And, and again, you can see it's fair, fair spread across the country, a couple in the metropolitan Greenbelt, a couple in Manchester, a couple in the West Midlands. Um, particularly important to bear in mind that although this research was done, it, done seven years ago, all these businesses are still going. So, so they, they clearly must be doing something right, and there clearly must be something economically viable about the work they're doing, because, it, because they, they have endured. And I'm not going to talk to this, you, you'll get this on the slides, but, but I think what's worth bearing in mind is that these businesses, so a wide variety of core food products, they often market their food directly through farm shops, so linking to the point I made earlier about the preponderance of farm shops in the green belt, or through a cafe on site. They, as Alan mentioned in his talk, they, they diversify quite a lot into providing education services, so, so work doing outreach work with local schools and often with primary care trusts. Uh, for a variety of business models and land sizes. And again, going to how, the, how these firms have, have managed to sustain themselves financially, I think these, the, these points hold a lot of weight, particularly the need for <coughs> diverse basis streams, be able to, the, the issue of price comparison with supermarkets and how, and how they get funded. Again, collaboration with health partnerships. Access to land is a big challenge for, for, for these kind of organisations. So, so, so in conclusion, I'm, I'm, I'm perhaps going to approach it, from a, as you'd expect, from a different perspective to, to the one that Alan mentioned, but with some common themes. I, th I think what we've seen from these businesses is that, is that food, and, food growing in the green belt can be a viable business, and it can provide a wide range of economic and social benefits. Um, but I think the critical thing that you need to do to encourage these businesses is to make sure that you're keeping land values down 
so that that so that these these groups, other community groups, can, can get access to land. It, it, if you become more equivocal about Greenbelt policy, then the hope value of a lot of land will rise and it will crowd a lot of these businesses out. Um, again, again, there's major scope to these businesses to be able to sell produce at the farm gate or through farm shops, and we've seen over time that, that a lot of these shops have emerged in the Greenbelt, so Greenbelt policy hasn't been an obstacle to them to it. To these businesses being set up or being located in the green belt. So, so I think there's a lot of, of encouraging practice to bear in mind, but, but I think what will be critical is linking it to this wider, this wider interest in encouraging nature conservation and public access to the green belt. So I think, I think at the moment those are the more prominent areas, but I think there needs to be a greater understanding of this work as well. Thank you. Sliders, yes? Yeah, I'm sliders. <laughs> Old school, I like that. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I'm actually going to take this from a bit of a planning perspective, and it's probably worth just giving a little bit of background on my, myself. I'm here because I'm the former chair of Garden Organic, the national charity that promotes organic gardening. Um, but it doesn't mean that I'm an uncritical advocate of growing food in green belts. And one of the reasons for that. Um, is my experience of the Metropolitan Green Belt. I live in Oxford, um, which is surrounded by Green Belt, and I've quite a significant part of my career, and I shall make a reference, several references that in my job, was in the West Midlands, where I was also quite heavily involved in issues around the West Midlands, uh, Metropolitan Green Belt. Um, I'm also a former Labour councillor in Oxford, where there are significant housing provision issues, and I, I want to kind of start from that place, really. Um, the concept of the Metropolitan Greenbelt. Should we have Greenbelts? Or have they outlived their usefulness as a plan to? And of course, I refer, of course, to the work of um, Professor Owen Macy, who's, who's something of an expert on this. And I, I'm not going to simply regurgitate what he says, but I am going to make a few references to it, because he correctly describes the, the Greenbelt as it currently exists as an, an orphaned policy, um, with the abandonment of the accompanying planning policies such as the New Towns programmes. And um, I, I, I basically agree with that. Um, we're, government policy now is to prioritise the use of brownfield sites and identification of city, um, <coughs> city spaces um, as the counters to land use constraint that the Green Belt um, basically consists of. And they themselves are not sufficient to meet the housing crisis in London and the South East nor the social equity issues that go with that. So we find ourselves with a chronic housing crisis, poor internal space standards, very high cost of housing in London and the South East region. Greenbelts don't have to any of this. So what actually is happening on Greenbelt now? If we, if we just think about it now, bearing in mind that Greenbelts were established in, as part of the whole kind of town and country planning settlement post the Second World War in the, the late 40s and early 50s, so long long before most people were born who were in this room, that included me. Um, people commute over to work. There's a lots of edge land and urban fringe activities like BMX and stock car racing tracks, livery stables, other outdoor adventure type activities like tent hauling, sewage works, waste recycling facilities, abandoned gravel and um, um, clay quarries for bricks, and those kinds of things. Um, but they also, they surround and protect expensive commuter villages and they protect them from development. So, you know, there may not be much in the actual value of the land, but the value of the villages based on them is absolutely huge. Um, there is some agriculture, and in particular there's a long tradition of market gardening. So, yes, we can grow food in the green belt. But what is this in agriculture and what are the implications for the green belt? Well, Land prices in the Green Belt are kept artificially low by its designation. I think both of my colleagues here agree on that. Um, but existing farm building footprints provide opportunities to expand, um, especially as the um, planning kind of system that we have is gradually being unpicked by successive governments in the interests of the reductions of so called red tape. So existing farm building footprints provide great opportunities to expand. And growing food in the green belt risks agricultural sprawl, farm buildings expanding into polytunnels, sheds, etc. 
and the temptations to change use from agriculture or agricultural uses to other purposes, commercial ones like holiday cottages, are actually encouraged by current government policy. Um, so the conversion of farm buildings to residential use is a good example of that. And this has significant implications for transport and other infrastructure in uh, the urban fringe and greenbelt. And if, if you like, what's current government policy is to say that it protects and supports the concept of the green belt, and I suspect you probably agree with this, um, but in practice it's um, the, the, the metropolitan green belt is suffering death by a thousand cuts, uh, which is kind of like the worst place it could be. It's neither protective nor is it, well, let's do something else with it. So, will growing food in any way either protect the metropolitan green belt or increase city food supplies and um, quality? I think this depends on what gets grown. Uh, I think Alan's comments about rapeseed in Watford were very pertinent. Um, high value produce in greenhouses, cucumbers, lettuces, tomatoes, soft fruit, uh, that's easily spoiled and more difficult to transport. Well, maybe. It's probably true that 40 or more years ago this was the case. But transport systems, supply lines, technology and scale, I mean, very little of this kind of produce is grown in the UK anymore let alone in the green belt. Um, the days when farmers walked their geese into market in London from Essex, I think, are small time. Um, the arrival of the railways in the 1850s, so we are talking you know, quite a long time ago now, fundamentally changed London as eating habits. Um, railway milk, as it was known, was brought up from Somerset and Dorset each morning in time for breakfast. Combined, of course, with the import of eggs and bacon from Denmark and meat from the USA, that became the basis of the Great English Breakfast. This was well established in Victorian times, let alone now. So, can we grow food in the green belt? Yes. But the, perhaps the question we should be asking is, do we want to? If we do, it's likely to be very niche activity. And I would suggest that that niche activity seems to me to fall broadly into two kinds. The first is that there are still a few what I call holdout family farms in Kent, Hertfordshire or the Birmingham Greenbelt in Warwickshire where the County Council's small holdings portfolio includes quite a few farms in the 30 to 50 acres um, range, generally used for poultry and pig production. Um, they're barely economic due to their size, they have elderly tenants, they are often operating in pretty insanitary conditions. They have outdated equipment. <coughs> they lack investment in plant. The model of um, county farms and small holdings isn't that great for investment, either by the council or the tenants. I can go into that in the conversation for you later. And I speak from experience as former head of county farms and small holdings for Warwickshire, which of course is, for those of you who are Londoners, basically the Surrey of Birmingham. Um, more optimistically, this is where I kind of pick up a bit on both the previous speakers, activities that probably should be seen as the extension of the current interest in urban agriculture are, I think, more relevant. City farms and community gardens are found in inner city locations, as Alan well pointed out. There were 2012 growing sites promoted as part of the 2012 Olympic celebration, for example. Allotments are something I know about. I wrote a book called City Fields, Country Gardens, a lot of essays. Um, and some of these um, are to be found in metropolitan green dot areas, like Enfield, which was where I was referring to, Worlow Farm, which I noticed was picked up um, by Paul, which I visited on a number of occasions, um, or Coventry's Coon Farm Country Park, which I'm familiar with from my work in the West Midlands. They're accessible to city kids fresh air, real cows and sheep, some interesting experiments, for instance, vineyards at Wallow Farm, you probably know that all. Um, some fairly big greenhouses with lots of tomatoes, and in some cases, sunny commercial crops such as lavender in Sutton, but of course I'm not suggesting you actually eat lavender, you get the point. Um, so what I'd like to suggest, really, as a kind of complete, is a kind of complete rethink of the green girl, uh, <coughs> in which food might have a role to play, but not a big one. Um, it seems to me that the opportunity we have is to refocus the pl current planning system to see the reinvention and reinterpretation of the green belt in the next decade. And we need to think about it in the context of um, climate breakdown. 
what we need to do is we need to look at alternatives that protect green space in your cities, which, ironically enough, considering the you know, green belt actually isn't really that good to do. So, as climate breakdown takes hold, uh, I think it becomes a much more pressing issue for city dwellers. Um, and here I have some agreement with Alan and some disagreement, um, but I think it's more a matter of how the policy works out and what ends up happening in green belts. Um, I think that we do need to see them as a, a, um, a resource for city dwellers seeking respite from summer heat in parks and gardens and near water. Accessible green spaces near big centres of population need to be reimagined as spaces for city dwellers to reach easily by public transport. I recognise that they can't live there. Although, once there, there ought to be proper infrastructure for walking and cycling. Quiet, cool spaces for contemplation and recreation. Fishing, boating, swimming, flying kites, reading and resting under shady trees, promotion of biodiversity, sports, places to have barbecues with friends, and the need to grow a little food in allotments and city farms should, I think, be combined with some serious approaches, bearing in my, my, my introductory comments about densification, poor space standards, etc., to the development around the existing um, public transport nodes and towns and villages in the Green Belt, of which there are a fair few, of eco villages and eco towns, uh, which can be integrated into those newly recreated green spaces and relieve the pressure that we've all been acknowledging is to be found in those very densely populated city centres of places like Birmingham, Coventry and London. Um, so this is a different vision from what we experience at the moment in the Green Belt, um, which are aggressive and protective farmers, nimby villagers, shady operators disposing of dodgy waste streams, um, and that is much of the fate of the Green Belt these days. Uh, you only have to travel four or five miles out into the Hertfordshire countryside, the Oxfordshire countryside or the Warwickshire countryside to see just how much stuff is dumped by, by illegal waste disposal outfits and all the rest of it. In, now, you know, this is a policy failure that's got nothing directly to do with crime. It's, got a great, it's a policy failure that's got a great deal to, to do with the way in which we imagine the countryside and the way in which we imagine the society as a whole that we live in. So, I argue that it's time to destroy the Green Belt in order to reinvent it as something that's much more appropriate for the mid 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now is the time we kind of try to open up this um, discussion and conversation to all of you. I think we've got three um, relatively different points of view in terms of Green Belt, and if I were to kind of try to summarize, Alan, I would say yours is thinking about the social equity of land um, and the um, disadvantage you may have if you live in the center versus in the suburbs in terms of space and access and densification. Um, Paul? Yours is more along the lines of that there are a lot of good reasons to protect the Green Belt and in terms of food and in terms of jobs, there are viable businesses and having that depressed land price is important. And then Martin, you're more of a let's try to reinvent the Green Belt and try to understand some better uses for it than what currently is happening. Yes? Are you speaking? So if I could open up to the floor, if you've got questions for the speakers themselves, or if you have a kind of an opinion. Yes? Uh, thanks. I just, maybe related to your last thing, you talk, I thought about like the UN report about food and feed security, that sort of insects and bugs is going to be sort of the future of what, what we will eat, perhaps. <laughs> so uh, I just wonder how you relate the, to the Green Belt, you know. Well, um, I'm quite keen on the idea that people start to eat insects and bugs, and I'm pleased to see that Sainsbury's now stops them as part of their range of foods to eat. I think that other countries, um, I mean, I was in China not long ago, and that's kind of part of the normal diet there. Um, uh, I've tried them quite a few times myself, crickets are pretty good. Um, but I'm not sure the Green Belt in the UK has a very important role to play in that idea. I suspect that they are actually more of an industrial production. Oh, I, I'll give you a slightly different perspective on that. Um, well, I think 
until they eat insects and bugs. I mean, first of all, make sure there are some there for us to eat, actually. Because, uh, as many of you have seen, there's, there's increased the evidence inside there about a catastrophic collapse in, in populations of insect forest species for species. And at current rates, we would lose about 40% of our species in the next two decades. If, and, and the consensus amongst scientists and uh, amongst the, the model of NGOs who we work with is that the critical thing that you need to do to turn that round is, is through less intensive agricultural reduction. And, and that's going to mean that we're going to need to put more value on the farmland that we have. I mean, yet, we're not, we're not often the, uh, the, criti the critics of green dimension that lost it is in intensive production. That's something that Dieter Helm talks about a bit as well. But we would see the solution not so much to, to, to allow deregulated approach to planning in the green belt, but to actually encourage more extensive use of land in the green belt so that, so that you can allow the habitats to be recreated, or all new habitats to be created where appropriate. And that has been done successfully in the green belt, particularly with the new value in the corn valley. So there are models of good practice to draw upon, but that goes back to the point that we made that. We're concerned at the moment there isn't enough being done to invest in long term land management to bring about it because there's going to be fewer other involved schemes in the green belt than there are in the green south of the moment. Can I just make a quick comment as well? I, I think the two points are very important. The loss of biodiversity is absolutely alarming. In some ways, it's more worrying than global climate change itself. I definitely accept that. I wouldn't say anything else as for the chair of Garden Organic. Um, and I think that uh, you know we've really got to address what that means in terms of what people eat and uh, using insects as a substitute for meat. I mean, basically, people need to be eating meat not five times a week, but perhaps five times a year, um, and that that is worldwide. Um, so I think that insects have got a quite important role to play, uh, but but the two things are, are different. And then yeah, and then also because it's really related to what is being said right now. My question was read about, um, there is a question that hasn't been uh, asked uh, on which depends, I think, or the, like the, the answer to the question, shall we grow food on the green belt or not, which is, what kind of agriculture do you want to develop on the, on the green belt? If it's about splitting the green belt in... Uh, like five chunks and give it to multinational companies that are using like in intensive agriculture with the pesticide, etc. I, I would rather keep the green belt as it is today without <laughs> doing anything. So, but um, if it's, I think it's the question of how this is done and how what what is the the approach and the potential in terms of uh, all the questions that uh, uh, that we've been uh, talking about, so climate change and uh, biodiversity. Um, people's health, uh, access to food, uh, education, these kind of things, I think this is a very important question. We don't, we don't need to answer. <laughs> just come back in quickly with a point, because I think it might inform some of the other questions. And I think one of the challenges of talking about the Green Belt is we get very rapidly into sort of binary of good, bad, keep 100%, mm. thinking of a whole lot. And, uh, and, and to be fair again, Paul and Sikari have done some of this work, starting to say, well, what are the range of uses in the Green Belt now? What's the range of types of lands in the Green Belt? And I think, you know, I'm certainly not arguing for us getting rid of the Green Belt, but if we remind ourselves that just the metropolitan Green Belt is three times bigger than the area of London itself, one might, in that context, ask the question, I think, reasonably, do we need to retain all of that um, do we need to maintain it you know, as it is now, or do we need to, or could we rethink some of that um, in a trade-off way, um, in different uses, some of them not being necessarily uh, development, but um, housing development, but other uses as well. And then I think leading to that, you know, understanding what the land is there, and thinking about what our services of uses that we might want. Just a little bit more on that. There is, there is an interesting debate out right there about what kind of agriculture there is in the green belt, which you mentioned. And 
Well, I think one of the things that we're going to be addressed in the future of the cultural policy is the effect of pesticides, particularly in terms of what we were saying earlier about effects mm. on the species, but also effects on people as well, because, again, some of it's come to light, only properly come to light recently, it's been the, the effects of the, the kind of effects on air pollution of pesticides spraying on, on farmlands, and that, that's something that will need to be best appreciated particularly around large towns and cities in the future when London is trying to create an ultra low emission zone, for example. Uh, the, the places that we talked about in the report, so I think most of them are very extensive, small-scale land management. A lot of them are organic farms. Um, but they're, they're sustained in particular. I don't know if you've come across them, they're very good at and do a lot of work specifically on farming in their lives in this area as well. They've, they're, they're quite interested in how we might encourage farming at scale on the edge of large towns and cities, and they talk in particular about the examples of Forty Hall in Enfield, and also a city farm at Barking and Dublin, kind of sort of. So those, those might be interesting examples of that scale farming. Okay. Uh, in terms of questions, wait, we had Elena, Richard, and, and then, okay? Uh, talking about the trade-offs, I wonder if what the panel thought about the ecosystem services framework and whether that actually helps us think about how we make some of those trade-offs. So, you know, is it about sort of faulty hall, the educational and you know, school and college groups going there? Is it about flood protection? Is it about renewable energy or renewable energy crops? So does, does that, that, that framework actually help us think about how we, how we make some of those trade-offs between different language choices, one of which is, you know, the provisioning of food services? <laughs> But other services like recreational uses or flood retention or carbon sequestration can, can help you actually think about which, which bit of land and, and what you're using it for. Uh, yeah, I mean, broadly speaking, I would agree with that. I think we just have to remind ourselves that Green Belt designation is a planning policy, not a farming policy, nor is it um, a kind of the sort of policy that you've just been describing, which that's more of a kind of Dutch model where we have it's, it's a much more integrated sustainable development model. Mm -hmm. um, the Green Belt was invented in it and, and implemented decades before anyone had even thought of the term sustainable development, let alone started using it. Um, and uh, the, the points you make, I think, are actually quite powerful because what they do is they say, to me anyway, perhaps the Green Belt is too simple a solution for what is actually quite a complex and nuanced set of issues that people who live in urban areas need to address. And those might be climate change adaptation or mitigation, they might be to do with biodiversity, they might need to do with recreation, they might be to do with education, as particularly the around food growing and, and consumption of cooking in the first place. All of those are relevant and, and important. And the problem is that the Green Belt to a very significant degree, it basically says, no, 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 no. And we need, therefore, to think about, for instance, uh, green wedges coming right into the cities, which is, you know, the Lee Valley is a classic example, which is the sort of thing Alan was talking about in his introductory piece. Um, and the, the way in which wildlife corridors and things like that operate in and out of cities, these are really important, as well as the point you just made about places like Barking and Dagenham, having a, a city farm at scale, which people can come and see and understand how food grows and how it gets to their table. Um, Richard? Yeah, let, let me offer what's perhaps uh, an enlightened American point of view. For, for one, I'm very surprised <coughs> that no one used the word sprawl. I you know, the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the American uh, affliction of mm -hmm. suburban sprawl. Uh, we live in New Jersey, which is known for suburban sprawl. And generally, you know, happily be corrected, but generally you've avoided that. And that is, to me, the integral reason and justification for, for the Green Belt. Unfortunately, as Alan points out, it does increase land costs uh, within the Green Belt. And it diminishes the value of the Green Belt. But that is the, the opportunity, and I must say enlightened, not that we would do it, but I'm surprised that it hasn't happened here, or maybe it has. The increased value uh, within the, the Greenbelt properties, properties within the Greenbelt, should be taxed, and you should meet the social obligation to provide housing to offset the, the external impact, if you will, of the Greenbelt policy. 
Now, why that hasn't happened here is the failure of government in the long term. Uh, and I don't know whether incrementally we can make that happen. Certainly that's not going to happen in the U.S. That's not what we do. We don't have regional government, but you do. So why doesn't that happen? Or why couldn't it, to Martin's uh, suggestion of reinventing the green economy? I think uh, I'd absolutely agree with your point about open school. I mean, it was a point that I touched on briefly in my presentation where I talked about the effects of green bar policy is a, is a planning designation, but you're absolutely right, open school, preventing open school is one of the key purposes of, of green bar policy, and it's the, the main reason, it's the main reason by which you judge its effectiveness. So, yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, certainly in terms of your point about taxation, I mean, it's an interesting point, but I wouldn't hold your breath waiting for this reason, mate, for it <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll just make a quick comment on this, which is I think that you make a good point but the American and British systems are very different and have been for a long time. The, the right to develop land in this country was nationalised in 1947, and that's what the whole concept of planning commissions are about. Um, and therefore, uh, actually, you need to have a, an integrated planning system which relates urban and rural, um, you know, countryside, coastal, um, city and, and infrastructure and housing and all the other elements that go to make up um, a planning system uh, work. And one of the great problems at the moment is that we have a kind of residual planning system, which is practically a licensing system. I mean, the, the Rainsford report, which came out in the autumn of last year, which I'm sure Alan and Nancy are familiar with, actually argues that the planning system is completely broken and that we actually have to start all over again. And I think it makes that... that um, argument quite powerfully, and I actually welcome either uh, Alan or Nancy's observations on, on, on what they think about that, because you know, your, your broad point is quite correct, and the problem is that we're slipping into a situation in this country where we need planning, we've got a much, much denser population, a much smaller physical space than you are, we, we kind of need it more than you do, but we're kind of throwing the tools away. So I think it's a great idea. Um, I would love to see how the kind of political favour and support for the Green Belt would change if householders living near the Green Belt or in the Green Belt suddenly had a tax bill for the uh, benefit they um, receive from being in or near the Green Belt. Uh, it might change the debate. In fact, it might be the best way of changing the debate quite significantly. I think it's on a very serious note here, a good point, and I think it points to um, a broader concern that um, we don't sufficiently debate the both the benefits and the costs of green belt. And I will come back to my sort of social equity uh, question. One of the things we don't do is look in terms of population, of which populations, either by class, um, income, ethnicity, are most benefit from green belt, uh, and who, who pays the highest cost in terms of uh, house prices, etc. In our uh, uh, report we did now a couple of years ago, um, arguing for some rethinking of the green belt and releasing of some green belt land, um, it's actually a very sort of small C conservative report, and it's not calling for a, just an easy um, elimination of chunks of the green belt. And one of the core elements in that was to say that if we if we are going to release green belt land, uh, it seems to us to be essential that having protected this land and suppressed its value for many decades, that we would not want to release it to the market unless we had mechanisms in place that allowed us to capture the uplifting value to effectively tax sufficiently the uplifting value from that land. And so, you know, in a sense, our report would take a long time. We, we, we talk about it as a long-term report because there would be some prerequisites, and especially in terms of taxation, we think that would be required in order to justify releasing Greenbelt land, we would need to make sure that we were capturing for the public benefit the, what would be a very... Um, significant increase in, in land values. So we capture it from, from that angle. We haven't, we, did, we haven't talked about it from taxing existing uh, policies in the Belt. And I think, going uh, back to Martin's point, I think it's just a question of there's not the political appetite for that. Very challenging. Mm. Um, hello, I'm Emily Norton. I'm a farmer from um, Norfolk and also head of rural research at Savills. 
Uh, so um, crossing the entire business obviously got to various interests in various different pots here, particularly fascinating conversation that I've heard, uh, learned a huge amount from. Um, uh, a couple of observations. First is um, uh, with my farmer hat on, the certain irony in sort of it's this classic kind of um, conflict between asking for biodiversity, asking for access to, for people, uh, asking for more nature, and then also asking to build houses on it. Um, because obviously the most destructive thing we can do to any environment is to develop it. Um, and um, outsourcing our food impacts overseas, it's um, you know complete lack of accountability uh, for the urban environment as to where our food is produced. Um, and so um, there's just a huge number of conflicts which I find absolutely fascinating in how we deal with those issues. I'm not sure I have necessarily um, solutions for them, but the questions, um, Alan in particular, you said about you know it being a restrictive covenant effectively on land, the way the Green Belt works, uh, and actually to come back to your question, which I think is a really good question, but the, the new uh, system of public money for public goods which we're being proposed with, whether there's more opportunity, do you think, for positive covenants on the way that land is used um, going forwards in terms of um, reinvesting public money um, into that system. Um, and the, other, um, the other point being, um, I'm going to an all-day conference tomorrow on um, net environmental gain uh, in, in embedding um, biodiversity offsetting in the, in the planning system. I mean, what opportunities do you think there are for us to make better links between the inherent cost and value uplift from development and how that's then reinvested back into um, the environment in a way that is meaningful. So if I start, so I, I think where we would probably, if I can speak for all three of us agree, is that what we what we do need is a more proactive approach to the green belt. As I said in, in my presentation, I think one of the problems is, is the way the policy developed, not originally, but what the way it developed was that it's a policy that sort of does, isn't linked to ownership. So the government can designate land, you know, the local authorities can designate land as Greenbelt, but don't, because they don't own land, can't they easily, proactively um, change how that land is managed. Uh, and I think anything, whether it's taxation policy that raises more revenue in order to provide incentives, and um, whether, as you say, it's a more positive covenant approach, whatever that is, that allows for, uh, because the land isn't going to be owned by the public sector, but allows government to um, signal to nudge people um, through incentives to be more proactive in the management, and I think that will be a positive thing. So, yeah, and I think we'll probably all find common ground there. I take your point, and I think it's an important one, that you, um, we have to be careful with these multiple demands of the Green Belt and that biodiversity and more public access are not, um, you know, not necessarily, often not at all, compatible. Um, and of course this, I just want to flip back into the, in the city as well, this of course is also true in inner London as well. And so for example, you know, railway embankments are a classic case where people say, well let's open up railway embankments to give more access to open space for people in cities. But these are very rich, often very rich environments of biodiversity precisely because people haven't walked over them. So I think we do need to think through um, that it's not about having all of these uses on the same bit of green belt. Again, I've come back to my point. It's, it's, this is a massively extensive area of land, and I think there are points at which we would want public access, yeah. points at which we would want to improve biodiversity. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot that I would agree with. I think, I think the concern that we have about that environmental gain is, is that well, it's two things. I mean, one is that it might not sufficiently value having land in from production in a particular area. So I think that might be something concern that you may have as well. And the other is also that, that we haven't seen as yet whether it's going to properly integrate the heritage element. Because in particular, a lot of green belt areas and places like Oxford are quite significant for it actually. That there's a lot, a lot of quite important heritage assets in, in green belt areas. That, Part of historic parks, but also ancient monuments, battle fields, and things like that. So, and, and often they, they're very bad. Green Belt policy has helped preserve the wider landscape from the purpose of those heritage assets. So, so that's something that you feel that under the current protection that game is going to take back, might be especially understood. But at the same time, you know, that, I, mean, that, I mean, there is a, a lot of support for it, so that, as long as it's not seen as a license to trash, which I think is still a wide concern. I'll just make a couple of very quick comments. One is, um, 
the biodiversity arguments in relation to public access, I think, are a little bit of a red herring. Um, the, the real issue is that you find that a lot of cities are more biodiverse than the Green Belt Road because of the way modern farming practices encourage the use of herbicides and pesticides. And I think that um, it's not necessarily the case that uh, certain kinds of recreational and public access use will necessarily reduce biodiversity. But, because Alan said, makes the point, there's a lot of space. We can do different things in different places, and I think that's, that's a good thing. The other thing I would say, I, I know that probably most people don't want to hear this word included in this lecture, um, but the implications of Brexit are not irrelevant to this argument. Because if we have some kind of hard Brexit, and if we have some sort of um, open and free trading arrangements around agriculture, as the NFU and Michael Gove and others are saying, um, it runs the risk that agriculture could cease to be a viable option in large parts of the country anyway. Because, um, you know, you're, you're, there have been several people have commented around food security, and I think food security is very important, and I think that we need to think about it quite carefully. But the fact remains that we, we, the, current, the current government policy around food security is to encourage the import of food from foreign countries and to keep it cheap. That is the current DEFRA um, policy around food security. And that means that, um, despite what Michael Dave says, um, farmers are you know, they're going to they're go to the wall if there's a hard Brexit or anything. I think that is the plan. <clears throat> that is part of the economic plan. Yeah. What's part of the economic plan? The, for farmers to go to the wall? Uh, I take confidence for that, disagree with that, and I also think the membership of the European Union and free trade uh, across borders has actually outsourced our, a lot of our domestic food security. And if, if the extreme weather of last year and sort of climatic concerns give us uh, any um, uh, pointers at all, is that actually we need to take more responsibility for fresh produce production in this country in particular. So I think this kind of debate is so interesting because there are so many opportunities to grow food better and, and locally and more locally to where people need it and where those food security and health issues really are uh, that we need to take um, the opportunity to see well we need to take the opportunity to see where the opportunities really lie in this situation uh, and how we can make the most of it. I don't disagree with that but it's not current government policy. I was going to say um, there doesn't seem to I agree with a lot of what the, the three speakers have said but I think one of the things I'm not hearing about is that that sort of technology growth that over the next, you know, you're talking about reforming green green belt policy. Um, what what the major technologies are likely to be that could impact upon the green belt or could be used in part to exploit the benefits of the green belt in terms of microagriculture. This is you know biotechnologies emerging so you could you could um, grow much more efficiently, as your colleague says, um, high-value vegetables, things that people need, produce, um, at a much more economic scale, and bring it in to the, city, the surrounding cities much more cheaply than having the you know, uh, produce being flown around the world uh, into uh, markets like ourselves. And, and also energy, that I'm sure we're, we're, we're on the verge of, an, of a huge energy revolution. And again, a certain proportion of the green belt, when reimagined, could possibly be used more effectively to generate power for the urban surrounding urban communities. And I think this is quite important because it, it's a generation of jobs. It, it, it's a, looking at a changing way in which cities and the surrounding. Um, hinterlands, trade, and exist places with each other. The, the existing models, I don't think, are going to last much longer. And I think there are huge, huge opportunities if you go and go to startup events and things like that, where you can, where people are talking about this kind of these kind of very interesting technologies. Besides the important things of doing, uh, you know, growing your own as a as a hobby, having you know, much more leisure uh, facilities. For, for, for the public and that more housing in certain places within the Green Belt. And, and it, well, I'm interested in your comments because I think we are on the edge of a revolution here. So it's quite seriously, it's not just insects, it's, it's and, and growing got lots of things. Five minutes left, so if you guys can comment quickly. And
Well, I think the, the main priority to think about with applying new technologies is to, is to get, I think, a more nuanced and uh, more sensitive approach to farming in general. I think that's mm -hmm. got to be the main, the main priority because... I'm sure it can, that can be easily accommodated in that. Because the, the thing is, is that the, the kind of damage has been wrought by really indiscriminate intensive farming over the past few years is something that's still only truly being to realise now. And exactly. And probably be around for a long time to come. So, so yeah, I agree with that, but I think that the main thing is to think about how we can, how we can reduce pollution and uh, make the countryside more, more friendly to the land. So that's the good. So I think in the short term, I'd sort of reference the sort of whole loop work idea. It's a great idea if we can loop where, near where we work and we plan in terms to reduce loop work units so people don't commute so far to work. But all of the facts and all of the data shows that commuter distances are expanding mm -hmm. over time. And in the same way, I think it would be obviously great if we grew food down the road, you know, people pluck carrots out the ground that they arrived at my house, you know, from 100 metres away or something, or I grew it in my back garden, which I don't yeah. uh, mainly because nature spends most of its time eating everything I try and grow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so in an ideal world, like, you know, that, that, that's great. And I'm not saying we shouldn't aim for that ideal world, but I think, I suppose, in terms of us here tonight, yes. this raises issues that go well beyond Greenbelt, indeed, even Greenbelt, um, to uh, supermarkets, the supermarket model, how, you know, global value chains, how goods are shipped and produced um, internationally. Well, it comes back to your points about you know, us uh, you know, having all our tomato supply from the south of Spain in plastic punnets. So, uh, I mean, I would, in principle, yes, I agree with you. I, but at that point, I think the Green Belt almost seems to me to become a rather actually secondary question to those, you know, those really big. Uh, economic questions and we provide food to us. From what I can see, that you know, growing carrots could be done in in carefully designed factories without all the creepy crawlies eating up the cat, it, it consuming a, a good proportion of them before they get into the paper cartons in the supermarkets yeah. in the future. And I think that there are just you know. There are these huge opportunities which are coming along within the timescales that you're talking about planning a new paradigm for the Green Belt. Yeah, I mean, my reaction is, I think, I think you've got some, some, you made some very interesting points there, but I think actually we need, I agree with Alan that mm. the Green Belt is a bit of a secondary point in relation to all of this. And the, the crucial point seems to me to be um, what people eat. Um, you talked about growing carrots intensively. Well, actually, people grow carrots intensively in Spain and Italy already. Whether they export them to us in England, I'm, I'm not so sure. But they yeah. certainly well, whatever them, it is, they certainly eat them in Spain and Italy. Yeah. Um, we, you, you know, we, you talked about we talked a bit about insects, and I think you know, um, vertical growing of things like lettuces, etc., is perfectly reasonable. Um, tomatoes, etc. I've seen very interesting examples in Iceland, where I mean, Iceland is the biggest producer of bananas in Europe. Who knew? Um, why? Because they grow um, everything from soft fruit to tomatoes and peppers uh, in gigantic greenhouses by their volcanoes, all heated by the, the, the warm heat that comes out of the volcanoes. But the point I'm making here is um, intensification is what kind of intensification? You know, there are sort of stories of massive intensification of um, uh, cattle and beef uh, uh, in, in this country, or on American lines, where you have herds of 10,000 confined to spaces six times the size of this room. That is not, that is not what we want. That is not where we're going. I make the point again, in a future society, and I mean like 15 years' time, not 150 years' time, People should be eating meat five times a year, not five times a week. <coughs> then we won't need that kind of intensification. But that's why I think that a consideration of technology, whatever it is, whether it's meat, veg, or meat in the mixture of it, needs to be part of that thinking, along with a restructuring of the of the green belt framework that we have at, at, at the moment, which you're advocating. Yeah. But I think it, it has to be part of it. I feel. Thanks That's very it. much. I mean, we can actually, we will be retiring to the pub, so we can continue on all of the discussions that we would like to have. There's some feedback.